Good morning. So glad that you're worshiping with us at New Hope Christian Church. If you would, please stand. And we will start the service singing together, Same God. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened to do the same thing for me. Your faithfulness, oh 
mighty river, come and fill me again. You may be seated. Hello. I'm just announcing about our Thanksgiving for next Sunday. Um, we are going to be needing a lot of volunteers to deliver uh, food to shut-ins and also to our fire stations and EMTs and also to Horizon House and Turning Point. Um, Amy and I will be going around to Sunday schools uh, begging for volunteers because we're going to need quite a bit. Uh, we did have a generous donation to help us pay for food. Um, if you've already signed up for food, go ahead and bring that, but we will be getting the rest. We are needing one turkey to be deboned and cut up and brought Sunday. Um, our shifts start at 2 o'clock to start cooking, and then we have to have um, the fire station's at six, and then also take shut-ins in Turning Point and Horizon House. And then we'll have another uh, shift at five o'clock to start cooking for the EMTs, which we need to deliver by nine. So if you see us pop into your Sunday school classes, we're needing volunteers, we're gonna beg. So thank you guys. Good morning. I'd like to call your attention to our bulletin and the remainder of the announcements. Um, we are having uh, marriage Sunday school options to continue uh, this week. Uh, it's in the venue. It's for married and uh, those considering marriage. And so that'll be in the venue uh, this morning after service in Sunday school. Uh, we have a chosen watch party uh, Sunday evening, uh, 6 to 8. So you're more than welcome to join us. And we have a good time. Uh, Hilltop Annual Meeting, uh, that's Tuesday, November, November 14 at 6 p.m. And there will be a dinner prepared. Uh, Jacob and Kendra, there's a reception on November 19. And uh, Jacob has chosen New Hope as his ordaining church. Uh, there's also a continuing series of women in the New Testament classes. They continue to meet at 10 a.m. Tuesday mornings in the venue. And if you have any questions, uh, you can contact John or Sarah for more information. Thank you. To 
deserve the glory. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory.
the gift of love. If I speak in the tongues of human, <laughs> and of all angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prosenic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and I hand over my body, so that I may boost, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not emulous or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endears all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only a part, we prophecy only in part. But when to complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then we do see face to face. Now I only in part. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these is love. That was good, Kinsley. The only problem with it is you did so well that I'm gonna ask you to do that again sometime. That was good. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but we are privileged today to have Mike Pence's fly flying around here. It landed on Christine, did anybody see that? And as soon as I saw it, I'd heard rumors that the fly might be here this morning to worship with us, but, but uh, that's, that's pretty special. And, uh, oh, the other thing, next week, uh, we're, we, I, I was flattered that Jacob asked us, Jacob Jones asked us to be his ordaining church, and of course we all uh, uh, agree that's something that I know runs through the congregation. And so please be, if you miss a, a, a Sunday, we have pretty good attendance today. Evidently, you all know how to hit the record button and get the Colts game recorded for today. But next Sunday is not a Sunday to miss, okay? That's going to be a special day. And afterwards, we're going to, in, in Jacob uh, and Kendra and Marigold's honor, we're going to go eat donuts in the Family Life Center during Sunday school hour. So come then. It's the only Sunday uh, on their little furlough that they can be with us. So come and be a, a part of that. How about we start off today by playing a little bit of Family Feud? Is that okay? Everybody good with that? Everybody's watched the show, I'm sure. So what you're going to need to do is get your hand on the buzzer, get ready, okay? And uh, we surveyed 100 people or whatever they say there. But I'm looking for the number one answer to the question, what is the moment in the story of Jesus that best tells us how much God loves us? I, I don't hear any buzzes. What, what would you say? Crucifixion, the cross, the death of Jesus, one of those answers they would have slashes, so all the different versions of the answer would be there. And that's right, isn't it? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus himself says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
Uh, likewise, the uh, Apostle Paul marvels at the God who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And that moment in the story becomes a part of song also. Uh, I mean, uh, Hillsong music, we sang it this morning, says, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. The cross is love. Chris Tomlin sings, God's love ran red. Well, I wouldn't want to disagree with what ding is our number one answer uh, today. Uh, as I do take it to be a great demonstration of God's love for us. But what I want to do uh, this morning with you is just probe a little bit deeper into this love. And maybe the way to go about it is to ask a couple of other questions. Why does God love us so much that he's willing to die for us? Uh, another way of going about it is, what is uh, the end game of God's love? What is its destination? Why the love of the cross? It's always risky to play psychologist with, with God. You shouldn't. In fact, you can't play psychologist with God. The motivations, God does what God does. So start there. But, but I think when it comes to the matter of God's love, uh, the words of Jesus... And the actions of Jesus give some answers to this so that we don't have to be too speculative about what's going on with God. Uh, isn't it clear that God's love for us is his desire to be with us, uh, to have fellowship with us, friendship, with us through eternity. The thing about the whole story that leads up to the cross, how does it start? God creates a beautiful, I would say, entertaining uh, cosmos with lots of interesting bodies in that world, celestial bodies and animal bodies, but as a final move in creation, God decides to adorn what he has made with human beings, a man and a woman, in his own image and likeness. These thoughtful creatures, uh, willful creatures, creatures capable of doing actual good. And it's interesting in Genesis 1, how God speaks into existence all the different things of creation, but God only speaks to the human creature. There's a new level of, of intimacy when this stage of creation comes to be. And in the garden, God continues to talk to and walk with and even partner with humans in the work that is in the garden. Uh, then, of course, two chapters later, we have the fall, that rebellion of human creatures against their creator, the, that good relationship, the intimacy is severed. The world cannot go on like this. At this point, when I, th when I go through chapter three of Genesis, I always think of how I respond when something that I create does not turn out so well. Uh, if, my, if in my kitchen, if I'm creating in the kitchen and my meatloaf doesn't turn out the way that I hoped, you know, I'm quite willing to dump it in the trash and pretend that it never happened and then head off to the restaurant. If you were here, uh, uh, but that's not the way God works. 
The, the creator never gives up on what he has made. The, that goes for the whole creation, but it goes especially for, for humanity. The bulk of the Old Testament is God working to fix what's been broken with particular attention to humanity, to you and me. He wants that friendship restored. Then the story of God takes a remarkable turn in the New Testament. When Jesus Christ, Son of God, God himself, third person of the Trinity, or second person of the Trinity, uh, we would say, takes on flesh to come into the earth and be with human beings. If you were here a few weeks ago, we spent a couple of different Sundays talking about Philippians 2, where, talks, where Paul talks about uh, Jesus Christ, who being in very form God, he is God, Jesus Christ leaves the heavenly realms, the glory that is there, in order to be with people in bodily form, to share the full range of human pain and suffering with them, to serve them, and to love them up close face to face. You may remember that when uh, the angel, the messenger, comes to Joseph in that pre-Christmas dream, he first of all reassures Mary that, uh, that or, or re reassures Joseph that Mary's surprise pregnancy is of the Holy Spirit. But the other thing that the angel does is say that the baby in her womb will bear the name that Isaiah, the prophet of the Old Testament, had spoken about. The people will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What a name that is. Name of my seminary, so it always sticks with me that way. Wait. Two, uh, actually, it is a word that only appears, I think it only appears three times in the Bible, but what an important way to name who God is and what God is all about. Jesus is God with us. And as Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is, the perfect snapshot of who God is, in, in Jesus is disclosed that our God is a very with us kind of God. That's the nature of God. A God who never turns his back on us even when it seems like he should. A God who uh, in the Old Testament stays relentlessly close to Israel. Uh, and, and there are even hints in the Old Testament that, that God's eye is on the world outside of Israel. All people are in view for God, and he is, in a sense, with them. He watches people, speaks to them, protects them, guides them. And then he finally becomes flesh in the person of Jesus Christ so that he can quite literally take an, an embodied place beside us and go through what we go through, touch and heal us, talk to us, love us face to face. We have a God who chooses to, to be close to us, who covets closeness with us. And God with us to the point of taking on what we will all ultimately face, death. So, what I'm saying, takes me a long time to say things, but what I'm saying is that the cross is certainly a high point in the story of God's love for us, but it's, it's, it's really sort of like, it's sort of just like the exclamation point. Uh, to a story that has gone that way from the very beginning. Uh, 
that God is, uh, that God always desires to draw close to uh, humanity. Uh, so we might just as, you know, we picked, we picked the cross as the location of God's ultimate love, but I think in some ways we could have just as easily picked the incarnation that God loves us and chooses to be close to us, and that's the heart of God. John 3.16, by the way, it's not entirely clear what kind of, what kind of giving uh, John has in mind when he speaks, when he says, God so loved the world that he gave his son. That in John 1, the giving that he's talking about is, is the incarnation, that the word of God that was there from the beginning becomes flesh in the person of Jesus. Can be, could be understood that uh, the giving of God is that total giving of Jesus, which certainly does culminate on the cross. Greater love hath no man than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. So back to my earlier question, what is the end game? of God's love? What's its destination? Why does God's love uh, lead to the cross? Because that is God's way of defeating death, which is separation from God, is what death is. Uh, and his death and resurrection make it possible for us to be with God in eternity. That really is God's love. That is the end game that for whatever reason, I don't completely understand it. I'm the guy who throws meatloaf in the trash. I don't get why God sticks with us, but God loves us so much that he wants to spend eternity with us. So given the general shape of the story, it's maybe not all that surprising that the vision of John in the book of Revelation, the last, the last uh, scenes that we have in the Bible, that what John sees is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, enthroned in a renewed paradise and surrounded by re-embodied people, and the voice from the throne says, and listen to this, okay? It says, look, God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. The aim of God's love that it is for us to be present to him. So let that, let that blow your mind away for just a minute. For whatever reason, God loves us so much that he wants us to be with him and he will do anything, including becoming incarnate, including Dying in order to make that happen, in order to make possible a relationship that goes into eternity. Interestingly, there are things happening even this morning that re reflect the extent to which God wants to be with us. Uh, we gather here today as spirit-filled people. Uh, Jesus God with a body, uh, before he left, said, don't worry, I'm going to give you something even better. After I leave, I'm going to give you a replacement, the Spirit of God, third person of uh, the Trinity, we would say, that Spirit to be with us, to be on us, even to be 
in us. And that spirit is present here this morning. God is with us as we worship. And after the sermon, what are we going to do? We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. This miraculously physical way that God has chosen to encounter us. Through flesh, uh, the bread, his body, and blood, the cup. Uh, communion is a genuinely with us kind of experience from God. There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good night. So back to the main point again. God loves us so much that he wants to be with us and is going to do anything it takes to make that happen. That was sort of a long introduction. Uh, we've, we've been in a sermon series about love for the past two Sundays. This is the final one. Obviously, we haven't covered everything. There are more sermons on love to do at some point in, in the future. But after last week's sermon on love and time, uh, I thought it'd probably be a good idea to talk about love and bodies because body embodied is the way that God chose to relate to us. Love is my act of being with, with people, and it follows the example of Christ who purposefully and so thoroughly brought his body to ours and continues to do so in the Lord's Supper and who did that so that we might be with him through the rest of time and beyond time. The great New Testament theologian of the body uh, is the Apostle Paul, who writes about the body with great regularity and clearly believes that faith and love, both of those are expressed through how we handle our bodies. We're rather fortunate to have Paul's thoughts on bodies that have been handed down in his letters. We're fortunate because letter writing was not Paul's preferred way of dealing with the congregations that he loved. In fact, it was the third option that Paul went to. It was his third go-to. I, I guess I'll have to write him a letter is what that was. His second option was uh, to send an ambassador in, somebody who was a body, a person, to go to the place and share with the congregation and, and work with them for whatever problems they, they were having. His first option, and it's expressed several times in the letters that we have, is to be with people bodily, face to face. Oh, how I wish I could be with you in person, he says uh, in a few places, because the fullest expression of our love is in the way that we bring our bodies to other people. Uh, body to body intimacy is, of course, foundational in marital love, where the connection is physical to the point that two persons become uh, one. I don't have time to deal with that in detail today, but John Shoemaker will be available after the service to answer any questions that you might have on that. But marital love is a sign of the body, how we bring our bodies to each other. Uh, our love to God, it turns out, is expressed bodily according to Paul. I urge you, he writes to the Christians in Rome, and I think what he writes to them applies rather straightforwardly to us too. I urge you to present what to God? He says, present your bodies 
as living sacrifices to God. If you love God, you will give the body that you have, uh, just like last week we talked about giving the time that we have, you will give the body that you have back to God. In corporate worship, we bring our bodies to God and we join them to other bodies and together we lift up our hearts and our minds and even our hands to the one we love. And all these individual bodies joined by the Spirit become another body. Uh, what Paul calls the body of Christ, the living presence of Jesus in the world. Also, Paul writes that our bodies are temples, similar to the Old Testament tabernacle and to the temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, both of which were places where God took up residence. Because of that, love for God can be expressed in how we care for our bodies, uh, where we take our bodies, how we use our bodies. And so, for instance, Paul says, don't join your body with a prostitute because that sort of defiles the body. I always think it's sort of interesting that Paul had to tell people not to, I don't have a sermon about don't buy prostitutes. It, it seems like it should be one of the things that goes without saying in the church, but, but Paul needed to go there sometimes. It's such a bad act because it desecrates both of the bodily temples that are uh, involved. Uh, the John, I sort of don't like that term for obvious reasons. The John and the prostitute as they engage in a sort of pretend love transaction that is not at all what love is all about. Uh, but I think when Paul talks about how that act defiles the body, I think he also has in mind, maybe he has primarily has in mind the body of Christ, of which every believer is a part. So when we bring ourselves to a situation that is not good in a lot of ways, we, take, we drag everybody else uh, into it too. And there, I think there are plenty of contemporary examples of how prominent Christians, through their bad choices, have dragged the whole church into what's happened and made everybody else look bad too. Sometimes Christian love is how we restrain uh, our bodies. Uh, sometimes it's about where we decide not to go. Sometimes it's about the organizations and the rallies and whatever that we choose not to to go to, what we decide to avoid with our bodies. But on the positive side, love is uh, joining the very pres present God, the with us God, is joining him in being with others. Being bodily present to our spouses, Maintain, maintaining a bodily nearness to our children and grandchildren, I would add, great-grandchildren if you have them. Uh, it's about bringing our bodies to worship, both to corporate worship and personal worship, however and whenever you decide to do that. It's about putting our bodies in good places and avoiding bad places, and especially I think it is about bringing our bodies to those uncomfortable places where we know that love is needed. To the sick and dying, uh, to prisoners, to those with addictions, to uh, stubbornly unrepentant people who despite that are in the image and likeness of God and deserve to be Loved. I was uh, coming in this morning, driving it, and I was thinking. I was thinking. I was coming in about the nature of Jesus' love, and one of the things that's sort of uh, sort of interesting, if you watch the pattern of his ministry, is he loves everybody. 
Jesus dies for us all. He'll do anything to be with every one of us. But during his ministry, if, if you read the Gospels closely, it's like he locates his body, especially in places where there is great need, uh, with the poor, with the disabled, with the, the lame, with the demon-possessed, with those burdened by great guilt. He, he sort of takes his body, which can only be in one place at one time, when he is the incarnate Jesus, he takes that one body to special places where there's great need. And I think we need to also. So, just take the love, uh, the love of God that you already know, he's willing to die for us, but take it the step farther. Why does God go through what he goes through on the cross? He goes through it because of how much he wants uh, to be with us. Uh, if you marvel at that fact, the fact that the creator of everything somehow, for some reason, wants a measly creature like you to be present to him for the rest of eternity. Uh, if that amazes you, and if you want to respond to it, you absolutely can. Jesus makes a way uh, for you to do that, and that is to bring uh, your body, interesting to, interestingly, to uh, a body of water, where, where, again, God is near us in a special kind of way, an unexpected way, and where God says, you're mine forever. I won't let go. We're going to sing a song of response, also a, a song of communion. I know some people, in fact, this morning, as early as, uh, as late as this morning, I had a conversation with somebody who wants to talk about baptism at some point. If you're thinking about those things, you can come forward as we sing the song. You can catch, catch me afterwards, but uh, that's the direction you should be. You should be moving toward that body of water. Let's pray. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And dark tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Happy Veterans Day weekend to everybody as well. Um, today I'll be doing your, your communion devotion. And I want to take the time to thank everyone that has been, a, has been a veteran or currently is a veteran, I guess. Um, like I said, yesterday was Veterans Day. And I've never served as a any member of the military or anything, but I've had family members, my, both my grandfathers, several of my uncles, and several cousins have served. And, and I say that to say this, that, that each one of them and everyone else who, who has served, who, they put on that uniform and they put their lives on the line for, for what they believed was Let's be the greater good for the country, and they deserve to be thanked. And so, if you are a veteran, I want to thank you for that from any branch of the uh, military, because you put your lives on the line. Veterans Day is a time to remember those who have served and currently are serving in the military. It is a time to honor those willing to, to sacrifice everything in order for us to to gain and maintain the freedom that we have in the United States of America. Such courage is admirable and fitting that we give these individuals the recognition they deserve. It's also fitting that we recognize the sacrifice that Jesus has made, that when he, he was willing and went to the cross to die to pay for our sins, his sacrificial death gave us the ability to live in spiritual freedom. We are free from our sins, and we are free from the guilt and penalty of our sins. We are free to live for God and receive all the benefits of that wonderful freedom. Every time we take communion, we are reminded of the freedom that we have in Christ. We are also reminded of the price that he had paid and that he had to pay to gain freedom for us. And when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we give Jesus the honor that only he deserves. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Jesus knew what he, it would take for him to serve and lay down his life, not only for his country, his family, and his friends, but for everyone. He made the ultimate sacrifice for freedom and justice and forgiveness of our sins. We take the bread 
in the cup as a reminder of the sacrifice that, that was made for us. Communion is a reminder of the blood that Jesus shed for us and how he was wounded to save us. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice that you made on that day on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And the reward that one day you would see when every knee would bow and every tongue confess that you are the Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness and your sin. And thank you for every veteran here. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. First Corinthians 11, uh, verses 23 to 26, it says, For I received unto the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in the blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. There are many things to be thankful for. Thankful for God's answer to prayer. Thankful for a service where we can come and worship. And a special heartfelt thank you to our veterans, whom of which this may not be possible today. A long history of veterans in service of our country. And I offer my heartfelt appreciation to you gentlemen and ladies. <coughs> Let's bring our prayer concerns to the Lord. Um, let's offer up uh, praise. Um, we have some surgeries that went well. We have Jimmy Earp, uh, Mahoney nephew, and he's doing well after his jaw surgery. Uh, we also have Ben Weaver, Kuhn's son-in-law. His back surgery went well. So let's uh, praise the Lord for those answered prayers. And uh, Pings, it's good to see you in service this morning. Uh, we want to continue uh, to remember Jacob and his wife as they travel here to us next week. Uh, our list is long, and uh, many times I read this list and I'm like, wow. But uh, the Lord, there's nothing too great for our Lord. 
Uh, we want to remember the Baxter family and uh, Rita uh, and her fall. We want to remember uh, the uh, Bev Barrett, her passing, and that's Pat Shoemaker's sister. We want to remember the, that family. Uh, we have a, a special request this morning for, for an Alyssa Stewart. Uh, there's a cancer diagnosis in, in her world. And uh, so, are there any other special requests that we should bring to the Lord this morning? Very good. Another answer to prayers. Are there any others? Come on up. Just a quick thing, real quick. Um, about a year ago, there was a special prayer service here uh, when I had an aneurysm, and God faithfully answered that prayer um, in the way that we and others asked. Um, I've had other people pray for, and this congregation pray for my cancer and different sicknesses. And I just want you to know that God answers our prayer. It's not always exactly like he asks us, or exactly like we ask him to, but he answers it. Sometimes immediately, sometimes later, sometime in the future. But no matter what, he works through it all. And I think each of you for your prayers a year ago that got me through the aneurysm for my family. I didn't know what was going on, so I was just happy-go-lucky enjoying the medications. But they were, as I understand it, in turmoil. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, your support and your faithfulness. I just want to read one thing real quick. Sorry. Okay, in James 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faithful will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. So God will answer might not be exactly how we pray for, but he works through everything and he answers every prayer. Thank you for your prayers, for being with my family. Thank you for friends that crawled in bed with me and held my hand, for people who came to my house last year and decorated for Christmas because I couldn't do it, and just little things all the way through. So thank you so much and Please remember to pray for each other. Amen. <laughs> um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. The list is large, but nothing is too big for our God. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the great things you have already done. Lord, we ask for your presence and healing for those we bring before you today. Comfort the brokenhearted. Fill those in need with the peace and joy that can only come from you. May your healing hand rest upon these we bring before you today. Comfort their pain, calm their fears, and surround them with your heavenly love. Be with our shut-ins, be with those in our missions, be with those who are serving in our military. Lord, you tell us in your word, ask and you shall receive. Our needs are great, but you, our Father, Savior, and Comforter, are greater. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. You are dismissed.